So our first topic is symmetry. And when we talk about symmetry, we have an intuitive understanding of what symmetry is. There are symmetric objects all around us, right? And in nature, there are very beautiful examples of symmetry. Also in the uh, human-made universe landscape, there are great examples of, of symmetry in buildings and bridges and things like this. This is just a montage here of some um, objects from nature that have various symmetries. So we have things like ice crystals that have six-fold symmetry. You have starfish or sea stars that have pentagonal symmetry. Lots of uh, animals have bilateral symmetry. There's a, a mirror plane in the middle of the animal. Right? So this bird, I like this picture because this bird looks like he has a frog riding on his back. It's a very strange bird. I don't know what, what species that is. And then plants have a variety of different symmetries. There's spiral, different kinds of features, the way the leaves are shaped, the way the stems branch out. Right? They're, they're, they have various kinds of symmetries that we're going to understand how to describe. Here's another example of bilateral symmetry, another example in, in a honeycomb of hexagonal symmetry, flowers. Here's a shell that has a spiral. And of course, we have chiral kinds of symmetries as well, right, with your two hands, for example, as an example of a, a good chiral object, pair of objects. So if you look around you, you may find that there's symmetric beings next to you. You might see somebody that looks like this. And if you ignore the Medusa-like hair <laughs> and the kind of crooked nose, this individual here has rough bilateral symmetry. Right? There's a mirror plane that runs down, splits down the middle of it. You might find somebody that looks like this sitting next to you, which has a different set of symmetries. Well, actually, it's the same kind of symmetry. Right? So humans have bilateral symmetry, as do most mammals. So if we want to talk about symmetry more mathematically and concretely, we need to understand the basic concepts of symmetry elements and symmetry operations. This is the language that we're going to use to actually quantify and rigorously describe the symmetries of objects, including molecules. So everything that we talk about can be applied to objects, and a subset of objects are molecules. So let's introduce first what a symmetry element is. Symmetry element is just a geometric object, like a plane, a two-dimensional plane, a one-dimensional line, which is also called an axis, or a point, a zero-dimensional point. A symmetry operation is a movement that we do with respect to one of these symmetry elements. So a movement might be that we reflect across a plane. It might be that we rotate around an axis or that we invert the object through a point. So we're performing a motion, a movement, with respect to a symmetry element. Now what we are most interested in here is which objects so-called possess or have given symmetry operations. When we say that an object has or possesses a symmetry operation, what we mean is that when we do the symmetry operation to the object, before and after the object looks indistinguishable to us. So if we, for example, have an object, we close our eyes, we do the symmetry operation, we open our eyes, we can't tell that the operation has been done. Okay. If that's true of a symmetry operation for a given object, then that object possesses that symmetry operation. That's the idea. There are basically four different elements, symmetry elements, and each of the elements has an operation that's associated with it. So the elements that we have, we have planes, as I mentioned up here. We call these mirror planes. We have two different kinds of axes or lines. We have a proper axis, and we have something that's called an improper axis. So a mirror plane, you simply do a reflection through the plane or in the plane. That's kind of the, the language. If you have a proper axis, that's just a simple rotation about an axis. You could rotate 180 degrees. You could rotate... 120 degrees, you could rotate 60 degrees, for example. An improper axis is a combination of these two. It's a rotation followed by a reflection perpendicular to the rotational axis. Okay. So we do a rotation and then we do a reflection. So the improper axis basically is with respect to two symmetry elements, an axis and a plane. And then 
The center of inversion is the element that corresponds to a point of symmetry. So the center of inversion is when we invert all atoms through the center of the object. And we'll describe exactly what that means, but you can kind of intuitively understand. You're going to take a point that's here, and you're going to go through the origin or through the center and pop out the other side. And you're going to do that for all the points. That's what's, that's what's called inversion. So we have four symmetry elements. There are only five classes of symmetry operations. We have the reflection. This is usually given the symbol sigma. Okay, so when we see sigma, think reflection. Our proper rotation here is Cn. Okay, so C tells us it's a proper rotation. N tells us what amount of rotation we have. The improper rotation is given the label Sn. An inversion center is little i, little italic i. And then the fifth one that corresponds to no symmetry element is the so-called identity operation, big E. And the identity operation is the simplest of all symmetry operations, and we'll start with that one. What we want to do is understand with examples here what these symmetry operations are all about, how to identify them in objects, and then how to build up the full list of symmetry elements and symmetry operations that a given molecule might have. Okay, this is all so that we can define the so-called point group of a given molecule. And if we know the point group, then we know a ton about the molecular vibrations of that molecule, the molecular orbital structure of that molecule, etc. So let's start with identity. So the identity operation, big E, is the so-called do-nothing operation. And that's why it's the easiest. Mathematically, it just means multiply by one. And it's included in the operations for completeness, for mathematical completeness. So almost everything that we talk about over the next three or four lectures is coming out of a mathematical theory called group theory. That was originally developed in pure mathematics and then it was applied uh, very, very productively to chemistry and other kinds of disciplines. We're not going to get into the, the meat of group theory, but this is one of the results of group theory that we have this mathematical multiply by one identity operation. All objects have the identity operation. And so if we take an object and we apply the identity operation, we get back exactly the same thing. Okay. So that's the trivial identity operation. Okay, let's go now through proper rotations. And we're going to go through mirror planes, uh, the inversion center, and then improper rotations. To understand and to follow kind of what's going on with some of these other symmetry operations, we're going to use a snowflake. So snowflakes are nice. Um, they often have hexagonal symmetry. This particular one has six long arms, and that's what we're going to focus on here. These arms are all labeled with just imaginary labels A, B, C, D, E, and F okay, that allow us to keep track of what happens to the arms of the snowflake when we do the symmetry operations. So the proper rotation, Cn, is just a counterclockwise rotation of two pi radians divided by n, or if you like to think of it in degrees, 360 degrees divided by n, okay, about some axis. And you can see with the snowflake that we have six-fold rotational symmetry. There's an axis coming out of the board here, which is a six-fold axis. And if we do a C6 operation, so six here means that we take 360 degrees, we divide by six, that gives us a 60 degree rotation. In a counterclockwise direction, that is the uh, convention, is that we're, we're talking about counterclockwise rotations here. Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna move, let's see, A to F, F to E, E to D, and so forth. And after the operation is complete, we have the same snowflake indistinguishable, we have just labeled here the different arms, so these are just fake labels. If we took the labels away, we couldn't tell that the snowflake had actually been rotated by 60 degrees. And so this C6 operation is a symmetry operation of this snowflake. Uh, when we refer to it being a um, six-fold rotation or six-fold axis, uh, is it just referring to the number of arms that are coming off from the center of the axis? It's referring to this number here, actually. So it's the same thing. The number of arms is six. It's a hexagonal symmetry, and that's described by having a C6 axis. 
So you have um, six-fold rotational axis. Yeah, they're all, all uh, different ways of saying the same thing. Yeah. Okay. So we can do one C6 operation. We could continue to spin it around, right? We could do another C6 operation. And if we do that second C6 operation, we move point C to point B and point B to point A, etc. Okay? Again, it's a valid symmetry operation for the snowflake. One way of writing this is that we do two consecutive C6 operations. So C6 done consecutively is a C6 squared. Okay? But that's the same thing as just doing 120 degree rotation, which is called a C3 operation because if we take 360 degrees, divide it by three, that gives us 120 degree rotation. And if we just go from here and just jump directly to there, we can get from here to there by 120 degree rotation. So two C6s in, in, in series is the same thing as a C3. Okay. Let's do it again. Let's continue to rotate. We do a third C6 operation. Still a valid operation. We get our snowflake back. This is the same thing as doing three consecutive C6s. This is a C6 cubed. And this is the same thing as doing 180 degree rotation, which is also known as a C2, right? 360 degrees divided by two, 180 degrees. And you can see that we've just put F where C is and C where F is that way. Okay, it's a 180 degree flip. We can continue. We do four C6s, that's fine. Four C6s as you might guess, four C6s in a row is a C6 to the fourth, which is the same thing as doing the C3 operation twice, 240 degree rotation. Okay, so it's getting, it's getting a little bit redundant. Interestingly, we can also think about clockwise rotations. These are usually called inverse rotations. And so if we had a C3 squared, which is a 240 degree rotation counterclockwise, that's the same thing as an inverse C3, an inverse 120 degree rotation. Okay? So we can think of it that way too if we wanted. Not so common to, to use these in the rest of the class, but it's just so that you understand how to describe clockwise and counterclockwise rotation if you wanted to. Yep. Yes, that's right. Yep, always the whole number. Okay, let's continue. We do five. Okay, five C6s. That's 300 degree rotation. Doesn't correspond to anything else in particular. We could do a negative or an inverse C6. That's the same thing as a C6-5. And then if we completed the loop and we did C6, C6 operations, then we've gone 360 degrees and all the labels are going to be exactly where they were to start. And so six C6s is the same thing as a C1, right? If we put one here, a 360 degree rotation doesn't change anything. And a C1 is the same thing as identity. So a C6 to the sixth is the same thing as E. And that closes the loop, right? So we have a number of different ways we can specify these operations. Normally what we would see, say is that this molecule has a C2, it has a couple of C3s operations, and a couple of C6s, and the E operation. And that would round out and complete all of the six different C6 rotations that we can do. Okay, are there any questions about the proper rotation example here for this snowflake? We will apply it in many, many times to different objects so it'll become clearer. It's just the number of consecutive rotations that you do. Yep. Yep. And uh, I get uh, the subsquid six. Uh, is it just how many arms a molecule has based on its le uh, axis of rotation? So it's rela it's related to the symmetry of an object, right? So you could have a C four, for example, which would be an object that has yeah ninety degree or square like, for example, is is one uh, object that would have that kind of rotational symmetry. You could have a C3 kind of rotational symmetry, like a, you know, a turbine blade with three arms, for example, or BF3, the molecule, right? trigonal planar molecule. Yep, that's right. So this is just chosen, the C6 is chosen here so that we can see many different rotations and what they would correspond to.
But you can have C2, C3, C4. You could have a C10. Right? In principle, any are possible. In practice, there's just a small number of very common ones. And higher, very high order rotational axes are fairly uncommon. Other questions about the proper axes? OK. Let's look at additional proper rotations here. So we've picked out a C6 axis that's perpendicular to the snowflake. The question is, are there any other axes that are rotational axes in this snowflake? And the answer is definitely yes. Right? So there are perpendicular axes to this one that are also rotational axes for the snowflake. So here's an example of one of these perpendicular axes. It's in the plane of the board now. And this is a C2 axis. Right? So there's a C2 axis here along, in, along this arm. There's a C2 axis here and a third one here. If we rotate this around 180 degrees, so this notation says perpendicular C2 along the length AD here, along this line, what we get is we're going to get A staying where A is, D staying where D is, but F and B are going to switch, and E and C are going to switch. And that's what's shown here. So F and B swap places, and C and E swap places after the symmetry operation is performed. So that's a valid symmetry operation for the snowflake, a perpendicular C2 axis. If you do the C2 operation twice, you get E. right? You get the identity operation. So we have these three axes that go through the snowflake's arms. But there are, in addition to those three, three more C2 axes that pass directly between the arms. You can see that. And so if we, line, if we write all of the different C2 axes on the snowflake here, we can see that we have three red ones which pass through the arms and three blue ones which pass between the arms. In other words, there are six perpendicular C2 axes for this snowflake. And this is a nice rule. Any object that has a CN axis must have either zero or N perpendicular C2 axes. Here what we have is a, an object with a C6 axis. So it has to have either zero or six perpendicular C2 axes. And in this case, it has six. The C6 axis that comes out of the, of, of the board here is called the highest order or the principal axis of this object. The principal axis is the axis with the largest number of N. So in this case, C6 is the highest order axis or the principal axis for the snowflake. And so if we count up all the different proper rotation axes in this particular object, we have a C6. Parallel to that C6 is a C3 and a C2. And then perpendicular to this principal axis are six perpendicular C2 axes. And if you try to find additional axes, you'll find that there are none. So that completes all the different proper rotation axes and operations for this particular object. OK. Any questions about that? Yes, in the back. Uh, what was the C2 axis? Is there the six perpendicular axes? What is the just C2 axis in the middle of the last bullet? Uh, where is, I'm sorry, this one? Uh, no, the last bullet. Uh -huh. that C2 where is this C2? <laughs> Yep, so this C2 is parallel to the C6. So we looked here, and we said back here a couple steps. Oops, this one. Three C6s consecutively gives us a C2. And so one way you can think about this is that the C6 and the C2 are parallel, right? And there's a C2 operation in addition to C6 operations and C3 operations all along the same rotational axis. Yep. Just sort of looking at the math there, if we then take the, um, the subscript and divide it by the exponent. Yep, that's right. That's a quick way to do it. Yep, exactly. Mm -hmm. OK. Reflections are the next symmetry operation that we're going to apply to this snowflake. The re reflection operation, remember, is sigma. And when we talk about reflection here, we're talking about internal reflection. We're talking about reflection through a plane of symmetry that's within the object. And there are many reflection planes, mirror planes, in this snowflake. Perhaps the most obvious is the plane of the board, right? 
the plane of the screen here. That's a reflection plane. And this one is a mirror plane that's called sigma sub h, or a horizontal mirror plane, because it's perpendicular to the principal axis of the object. So the principal axis is coming out at us. The perpendicular mirror plane is the one in the board. And so it's given a horizontal designation, horizontal mirror plane. So that's one of the many mirror planes in this particular object. Okay, let's look at some other mirror planes. We'll come back to this in a second here. Here's a snowflake written with additional mirror planes inscribed. These mirror planes are parallel with the principal axis. And there are six total mirror planes. There's three that run through the arms, right? each individual pair of arms. And there's three that run between the arms, dihedral mirror planes. Those that run along the arms and are parallel with the principal axis are called vertical mirror planes. And th those that run between the arms are called dihedral mirror planes. Okay? They're given the designations V and D. All of these are parallel to the principal axis of the object. And just like we had a certain uh, number of perpendicular C2 axes that are possible, we have a certain number of vertical and dihedral mirror planes that are possible for an object. It's either zero or N. And in this case, it's N, it's six. Right? We have three vertical and three dihedral. And so altogether, the number of mirror planes that this object has is seven. We have the horizontal mirror plane in the plane of the board. We have these three verticals and we have these three dihedrals. So we'd say there are seven different mirror plane possibilities in this object. Let me go back a step here. Just um, for completeness, if you perform a mirror plane n times, a mirror, a mirror operation n times, where you have n as an even number, then you just get the identity. For example, if n is 2, and if I reflect once and I reflect back, then I have done nothing. And if I do that four times, I have also done nothing. If you have n odd, then no matter what the value of n is, that's just equal to sigma itself. Right? I reflect, I reflect back, I reflect a third time, that's the same thing as just reflecting once. So this is just for completeness. This may be useful in the future. Okay. So we've done proper axes and we've done, we've done mirror planes, reflections. The next symmetry operation that we want to talk about for this object is the inversion operation. This is little italic i. What does inversion mean? It means the following. Each point of the object is moved along a straight line through the center of the object, which we call the inversion center. And it's moved to a point an equal distance from the center on the other side. In other words, all coordinates x, y, z become negative x, negative y, negative z. You're flipping the coordinates through the center of the object. It's possible for an object to have either one or zero inversion centers. You can't have two inversion centers. And the snowflake, by almost by inspection, just looking at it, you can tell that it has an inversion center. Right? If we take this arm and we go through the center and we pop out the other side, then we are good. That arm goes there, that arm goes there, and so forth. And all the points of the object, this little arm here, if it was drawn to be perfect, would go end up there, going right through the origin, and pop out, and would give us an indistinguishable orientation of that snowflake. So the snowflake, ignoring fine detail on the snowflake, has inversion symmetry. And it has an inversion center. So we now have a fairly large number of symmetry operations that this snowflake has. Right? But we're not totally finished yet. Here's the inversion. If we do the inversion, all the labels just swap places through the origin, through the center. So inversion is, is quite an interesting operation. Similarly to the uh, reflection operation, if you perform it n times where n is even, you get the identity. If you perform it n times where n is odd, you get just the inversion. Okay. So if I invert and I invert back, n would be equal to 2. That's the same thing as doing nothing. If I invert, invert, and invert, that's the same thing as just doing it once. So what objects have inversion centers or inversion symmetry? These objects here have inversion centers. These objects here, which are um, of some chemical importance, have no inversion centers. 
So octahedra, this guy has an inversion center, boxes, squares, rectangles, and parallelograms all have inversion centers. You can find a center of that object whereby if you exchange all the coordinates, you will get the same object. Objects that have no inversion centers are triangles. So if you find the middle of the triangle and let's say you invert this vertex through the center, it'll pop out here, but you'll have flipped the triangle over during the inversion operation. It's not an inversion operation. Right? There's no inversion symmetry. Same thing with a tetrahedron. Okay? This is one of the most important examples, of course, for chemistry. So CH4 does not have a center of inversion. If you do the inversion operation, what you do is you, you move the, this fourth hydrogen here over here, the third hydrogen down here to these two places, and you swap these guys through the carbon and over on this side, and you, what you see is that this does not, is not the same thing as that. Right? It's related by rotation, but it's not an inversion operation. And uh, pentagons also don't have inversion symmetry. Um, so uh, looking at the tetrahedron um, there, I can't help but think back to organic chemistry and the weak stereogenic centers. Yep. Think about, let me see inversion of those. Is C4 not applicable just because the hydrogen atoms are identical uh, around that center there and so you don't have a stereogenic center? Or um, So you don't have a stereogenic center in this case, right? There's not a chiral center. Mm -hmm. But would you still see inversion even if it could be considered so we have to be careful about what we mean by inversion. Here what we're talking about is a mathematical operation, a geometric operation. What you may be referring to is actually um, uh, movement of one of the atoms to the other side of the molecule, for example. Or uh, you know, a, trigonal, a trigonal pyramid or something like that flopping back and forth. That's inversion in a sense. But that's an organic chemistry definition of inversion. This is different. Okay. So what we're talking about here is a mathematical description of taking all the coordinates and uh, giving them their negative values and seeing if the object is um, indistinguishable after that operation or not. Yeah. So from your inversion image of the snowflake, it looked the same as a C6 cubed. Is that always the case? A C6 cubed. Um, 180 degree, yeah, it is, it is uh, exactly the same thing, right, for, the C, for that particular object for that uh, hexagonally symmetric object, yes. Are there objects that don't have Yes, symmetry? yeah. So, so the, um, for, for a hexagonally symmetric uh, object, that is going to be true. But if you have something that's, uh, let's say, C4 symmetry, then it's going to be different. It would be the same thing as a C2 operation, right, if it's, if it's a flat object like that. Right. Yeah. If it's a three-dimensional object like an octahedron, it's not going to have that kind of relationship. Right? Because then you've got to worry about the below plane and above plane um, arms of the octahedron. And those will not be reproduced in the same way for like a C4 squared and an inversion operation. It will be different. Yeah. Okay. Okay, and then finally, and most um, confusingly in some ways, this is the most complex operation, the improper rotations. So the improper rotation operation, remember, is SN. And this is a rotation followed by a reflection perpendicular to the rotation axis. So this is also called a roto-reflection. It's a combined operation. Rotation, reflection, roto-reflection. So one object that has an uh, improper rotation axis is methane. And it has an S4 axis, actually a few. So if we look at the S4 operation, what are we going to do? Okay. So here's methane that's inscribed in a cube. You may know that you can draw a tetrahedron by uh, painting in opposite corners of the cube with the object. So we're going to label this H1, H2, H3, and H4 so that we can just keep track of where the hydrogens go. So an S4 operation means that we do a C4 rotation followed by a perpendicular reflection. So here's our S4. We first do a C4. That moves H2 to this position here. It moves H1 to this position here. And the same thing for the hydrogens on the bottom. And so we get this kind of orientation. Clearly, a C4 rotation in itself is not a symmetry operation of a tetrahedron. But if we follow the C4 to complete the S4 with a perpendicular reflection, Right. Here's the reflection plane that's inscribed here. It's through the carbon, of course, through the center. Then what happens is the H1 goes down here, the H2 goes down here, the H3 and H4 pop up the top, and you end up with this orientation. And this is indistinguishable from this. Right. 
But with our labels, of course, we can see what's happened to the individual hydrogens. This hydrogen here has moved down here and so forth. But that is a good symmetry operation for methane. We could do it a second time. Okay? If we do a second, a second S4 operation starting from this position here, okay? we bring that down here. We do a C4 followed by a perpendicular reflection. The C4 is going to move H4 here to there, H3 to here, and so forth. And then we reflect and we end up with this particular orientation. It's the same thing, indistinguishable from the starting object. It's also exactly the same thing as if we just did a C2 operation. Right? So you can go from here to here directly with the C2. That moves H2 here and H1 there. And you can see that's what's happened. Or you could do two sequential S4s. So we can build up a little table. Okay? If we just do one S4 operation, we just call that an S4. If we do two, we call that a C2 rather than an S4 squared because it's simpler. Right? The C2 operation is simpler, so that's what we go with. If we did 270 degrees, three sequential S4s, we'd call that an S4 cubed. That's a unique symmetry operation for this particular object. And if we did 360, that's four S4 operations consecutively, we just call that E rather than S4 square, or, uh, uh, to the fourth. Okay. Again, because it's simpler. So the, the unique operations in this particular example are just the S4 and the S4 cubed. The other two possible S4 operations are more easily described as a C2 and an E. What do the H stand for again in the subscript for sigma? Um, oh, the H is horizontal. So this is horizontal in, in, in the sense that it's perpendicular to the rotational axis. So anytime you see a sigma H, think, I had a rotational axis, and now I'm going to do a reflection perpendicular to that axis. OK. The snowflake has S operations. It has S3 and S6 operations, but they're not too insightful. So instead, what we're going to do, and it looks like we're going to tackle this mostly next time, is describe the SN operations with a real molecular example. So we'll, we'll begin that next time. Let me just finish by saying that if we do an S2 operation, it's the same thing as inversion. An S2 operation would be a C2 followed by a mirror reflection perpendicular. And that's going to go C2. And then here, this would be the, the end position for an S2 operation. And you can see that this is just an inversion of the original object. So an S2 is equal to I. And an S1 is simply a 360 degree rotation followed by a reflection. So all that is is just a reflection. So S1 is just equal to sigma. It's the same thing as sigma. So it's important to be able to recognize um, when an operation that looks complicated is really just a simpler operation in disguise. Okay. So we will pick this up with our molecular example of staggered ethane on Monday.